Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. This week we're listening to an episode of My Choosing, and it's from a show we haven't featured before, Rod Serling's series Zero Hour. Today's selection from the series is titled Skylab, Are You There? Young Rod Serling was inspired by the thrillers and tales of adventure he heard on the radio as a boy, counting Arch Obler as one of his favorite writers. He began his own writing career in 1950, working for WLW Radio in Cincinnati. But it wasn't until he moved to television that he really made a name for himself with creations such as The Twilight Zone and Night Gallery. The Twilight Zone premiered in October of 1959 and ran for five seasons, and Night Gallery began with a pilot in November of 1969 and ran until May of 1973. Soon after Night Gallery left the air, Serling returned to radio with the anthology series Zero Hour. At first, the series would broadcast five days a week, telling one story in five parts each week. For the second season, the show kept its five days per week format, but each episode was its own complete story instead. Each week featured a particular actor in all five installments. During the week of May 27th through May 31st of 1974, which included Skylab, Are You There?, the featured actor was William Shatner. Serling and Shatner had famously worked before in the episode Nightmare at 20,000 Feet from the Twilight Zone. They reunited for an episode of Night Gallery entitled Can a Dead Man Strike from the Grave? After Shatner's iconic turn as Captain James T. Kirk from Star Trek, he was at a point in his career where it was difficult to find quality roles. Happily for Shatner, Serling could see past the stereotyping that was proving to be an obstacle at the time. We should also point out for any listeners who may be too young to recall, Skylab was a real thing. It was the United States' first space station and was occupied from May of 1973 to February 1974, three months before the episode was broadcast. It did suffer damage to its solar panel arrays, and the crew did have to perform repairs and free up one of the arrays that wasn't opening. Ultimately, the orbit of the unoccupied station decayed, and it's disintegrated in the atmosphere on July 11th, 1979. But for now, let's turn back the clocks to the zero hour and ask the question, Skylab, are you there? First broadcast, May 30th, 1974. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. Today, Keith Waters' double tale of terror in space. Skylab, are you there? Starring William Shatner. In a mutual broadcasting system presentation of The Zero Hour. Brought to you by the Ford Motor Company, Shenley Industries, Matus Wine, Beech Nut Chewing Tobacco, and Dial Soap. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. This is Hugh Downs with another car buyer's report from Ford. Comparing the total cost of ownership is the only way to be sure you get your money's worth when buying a new car. And Ford says there are three important considerations that make up the total cost of ownership. Purchase price, operating economy, and trade-in value. Don't overlook that last one, trade-in value. 
I'd like to give you some interesting facts about trade-in that are difficult for the average consumer to come by. Like the fact that based on a national average of NADA wholesale prices, both the 1973 Torino and the 1973 Grand Torino returned more of their original purchase price than their closest sales competition. The facts speak for themselves. A solid, well-made car will generally return more at trade-in. Ford says that's one of the reasons why Torino is the best-selling car in its class. The closer you look, the better we look. Beyond the fragile envelope of air that protects this planet lurk many mysteries of the universe not yet revealed to us. But consider this. Perhaps they have been. But there is a decree from some higher authority that will not allow us to be told. What then? How are you coming, John? Doors all are tricky. Number four still won't extend. Wait. I thought I felt something move. Anything? No, for a minute there. I'll keep working. Uh, this is Houston. Do you copy? Go ahead, Houston. Uh, what is your status on the panel? Panel two and three, now fully extended and operational. The arm on four panel is still askew in its channel. Roger. Uh, let us know if we should recompute any of your program. Wait. It's shifting. John, what's wrong? Telemetry on Colonel Ed's vital signs fluctuating erratically. John, can you hear me? John! Pat, suit up. I'm going out. Right. Houston, are you copying? Roger, Colonel Ebb. Colonel Ebb is not responding. Maybe injured. Dr. Kent and I are suiting up now. We will depressurize and I will attempt to bring Ebb back in. Roger, Colonel Ebb. Dick Conroy is on his way to the floor. He will be taking over. Pat, switch on your suit transmitter. Can we both go out? No, you stay here and set up your surgery. Skylab, this is Houston. Dick Conroy, are you copying? Roger, Dick. We are now depressurizing lab. Ask your knee for Right, moving hatch. Jack, Ed's signs are weakening. Roger, Houston. Stand by. Houston, I'm setting up the mobile video scan service side. We will monitor. Skylab, we are showing attitude change on the station. Can you advise? Phone one. Move Houston, can you read the patch? Five by five, Jack. I am drifting toward the capital. Houston, I can confirm. We're rotating laterally and kick off the air. Also, slight horizontal rotate, but erratic. Houston, it's possible that when the panel pops, its torque caused the station to spin. That must be corrected immediately. Angle rotation will cause orbit decay. Can you give me time brackets on the make correction? Austin, set it up on the computer. Roger. I can see him. The colonel sent it out to the extreme of his lifeline. John. Can you hear me? Pat, that's good on the camera. We're following visually. A movement from him. Almost there. Vital signs very erratic. I got him. Bring him in now. Roger. Pat, can you take decay corrections? I'm standing by surgery. Can you execute corrections from your station? Roger. Set up on the board computer through Orient Circuit. We will feed. Pat, coming in. Give me a hand. Transmitter, are you copying? We are copying. Jack, look at his chest. Mm. Let's get his suit off. <laughs> Houston, Colonel Lev's on the table. Pat is examining him now. I am checking capsule. Standing by, Scott. Houston, Ev has a massive chest conduction. Possibly six ribs shattered. Two feet as if they may have shifted into the heart wall. Skylab, you will have to abort the mission. Roger, Houston, I'm working on that now. Pat, what a chance if we bring him down. Better than if he stays here. The sooner the better. Hold it, Pat. Houston, we have a problem. We cannot abort. I repeat, we cannot abort. Return capsule will not take pressurization and number two fuel tank punctured. Are you sure, Jack? Positive, Houston. Fragments of the solar panel must have punctured capsule. We cannot return to Earth. Hey, 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 Matus Rosé. Matus is an old world rosé wine people enjoy everywhere. Like down in the Delta, they know the blues are what you make it, and that the light, easy to like taste of Matus Rosé makes the meal. Hey, hey, West Coast, Matus 
place is out of sight, but you see it everywhere. And in New England, Matus Rosé is perfect for that elegant evening on the town. Matus, the rosé wine that goes with everything good, anywhere, anytime at all. Imported by Dreyfus Ashby and Company, New York, New York. Dick, here are the figures for the shoot. Good. Dick, you're going to wipe yourself out. And the sympathy. I'm sorry, you're right. These show the Saturn on Pad 9 will be operational in 11 hours. How about Eckert? He's lucky. He just finished simulation. He'll be ready when we are. Well, let's give the good news to Skylab. Potter! Activate the link. Hi, Mr. Conroe. Thanks. Skylab, this is Houston. We are copying, Houston. Is Jack monitoring? Yes, sir. He's in the capsule of the pack. We can mount a Saturn for rescue. We go to countdown in 30 minutes. Major Kenyon Eckert will be a command pilot. We are programmed for an 11 hour count, and if we get lucky. Wait a minute, strike that. We are lucky. We can rendezvous at 20 hours, 30 minutes. Houston, we don't have much time. Colonel Ed is critical, barely holding his own, still unconscious. Hart is getting very erratic reading. We're all praying. Jack, do you copy? Why, you to know us here. The capsule's worse than I thought. Even if I could get up pressure on you. Houston, stand by. Colonel Ed Hart has stopped. I'm attempting a journal and I'm hot. Skylab, your transmission has been interrupted. Say again. Skylab, do you copy? This is Houston Skylab. Are you there? Yes, I'm getting telemetry on the lab, but... But what? You're not going to believe this. There is no telemetry on life sign. That can't be. See for yourself. That's crazy. According to this, there's no one on the station. <laughs> Dick, they're locking down the hatch now. All right. Let me know when Eckhart comes up. And keep the press out. Have PR tell them we'll do a conference once Eckert's on his way. Eckert. Right. Major Eckert, Conroy, how do you feel? Perfect. You're in a rush. So do you. We are T minus 30 and counting. Roger, I'm ready to fly this bird. So are we. Anything new on the station? No, and we're not telling the press anything except we've got a communication problem. Remember that when you get on the command circuit. Got it. That's hard to figure. Got to be a simple explanation. But we know they're there. I know it. Yeah. Well, where else can they be? 30 seconds and counting. Second stage tanks now pressurized. 25 seconds. Power transfer complete. 20 seconds and counting. All systems go. Guidance is now internal. 15 seconds. Green. All systems green. 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. All systems go. Looking good. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines firing. Second stage. Second stage firing, 10 seconds. All right. All right. Way to go. All right, all right, all right, all right. Take your seats. Calm down. I've got a prepared statement. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll have to take this as it is. I've got no time for questions. Here's the status. Major Eckert is approximately one hour from docking with Skylab. He'll transfer Colonel Ebb to the capsule and bring him back to Earth. Well, yeah, but now, hold it. Have... Will you hold it, please? There's no reason to believe they're not up there. I know what's on your mind, but let me assure you in all probability there's been simply a communication failure. And that's all it is. Eckert's job is simply to return Colonel Ebb. That will give us a breather and time to figure out how to make the necessary repairs in the capsule. That's it. Major, you my Major, 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 I'm now depressurizing the capsule. I will walk across to the station. I'm now leaving capsule. I will secure a line to the station from the capsule. 
if you'll forgive the analogy, tying up like this makes me think of the horse and buggy. Modern ingenuity, Major. Approaching station hatch. Austin, any change in telemetry? Nothing, Dick. The suspense is killing me. Yeah. Houston, I'm inside the station. Houston, there's no one here. <laughs> Glad is what happens when you use Dial Soap. It starts right out with a clean, fresh scent that's like nothing else. To get you going clean and fresh. Dial washes away the cause of odor on your skin. You just can't buy a better deodorant soap than Dial. And that's saying something. Rescue, this is Houston. Go ahead, Houston. You are to prepare for return. We're reprogramming for re-entry and we'll feed the data shortly. We have several assignments for you to accomplish before then. I'm copying. Set up the cabin for video scan. We're going to fine-tooth comb on video for examination. Also have the infrared adapter ready. Then pull all film from the analyzers and transfer to your vehicle. Roger. Video scan is now operating. Take it any time. Switching now. Major Eckert, are you sure you switched the scan to inboard relay? Roger, Houston. I show power on the equipment. Okay, stand by one. Dick, can you come here? What do you got? A carrier wave, but no picture. It's almost as if there's some strong energy source blocking transmission. Slide over. I'll use your board. Eckert, check your gamma analyzer now. All right, doing it now. Hey, that's high, Conway. About five over twelve interior. Okay, stand by. What do you think you've got? Mr. Hunch. Crazy. Probably nothing. Eckert, I want you to set up the infrascanner for interior. Can do. Give me a minute. Right, and when you've got it set, patch it through the board and scanner circuits. Austin, switch the feed to the board scope. Working. Really now. What was that? Houston, what are you getting? I don't mind it. Eckert, now listen carefully. I want you to pan the scanner left to right and freeze when I say. I've never seen anything like it. Free scan. Impossible. How? Houston, what have you got? Major, we are looking at our Skylab team, plus there is one human form with them. You mean they're up here with me? The way it looks. The infra images are very hazy, but I'm sure it's Pat Kent, Jack Elton, and Colonel Ebb. The other form is gesturing and pointing towards the scanner. Oh. 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 We've lost the scan. Austin, are you all right? Yeah, yeah. Just lots of spots before my eyes. Rescue, this is Houston. We're getting no visual on infra. Switch back. Houston, Colonel Ebb. John? John? Is that you? Very much so, Dick. Alive and well. Oh, Pat said your heart stopped. Dick, I must request that we discontinue conversation. Would you please go to scrum on the priority circuit? Roger, switching now. Scott, you read. Roger, Houston. Dick, we've been requested to keep the following information secret, at least for a time. Pat will fill you in on the beginning sequences. Houston, what has happened is truly without medical precedent. Colonel Ebb was brought back to life. Mr. Conroy, we have been watched. What? What do you mean? At the moment, the colonel's heart stopped. There was a blinding light shift in the lab. It was accompanied by a physical wrenching, almost as if our lives had shifted in time, which in fact it did. A man, no, better called a humanoid, was suddenly in the lab with us. He, she, 
told us it had been ordered to return Colonel Epp to life. I'll take it, Pat. Houston, the alien's name was Hobb. It left a message for us to play as explanation. Jack is integrating it into your circuits. Are you receiving visual? Yes. What is that thing? They call it a communicube. A tape recorder? In a way. As they explain it, the cube projects audio and visual into any receiver, electronic or the mind. Stand by. Hop is my designator. I am a special monitor assigned to your planet. For the past 600 years, it has been my duty to observe and report your progress toward space exploration. I represent, in your reference term, the Council of Worlds, a higher order civilization of 2,000 world planets. The Council is responsible for admitting new worlds into the Federation when they have attained a proper civilized level. Your planet has not yet attained that status. As the observer, I am gifted with the ability to read alternate futures. When the death of Colonel Ebb occurred, it changed the future course of Earth's progress. This could not be allowed, and thus the Council gave permission for real life. To explain, Colonel Ebb is, will be, the dominating personality responsible for your reaching the civilized status for membership. He is, will also be, needed for future contact and space exploration. You are advised under maximum penalty to hold this information in absolute secret. Under no circumstance is this to be broadcast to the people of Earth at this time. This is Hob. We will be waiting. Yes. The cube has disappeared. Council's instructions were very specific. Only that Skylab had a problem with its solar panels and power. That is all. Under penalties. I hate to think what they might be. Prepare for return to Earth, Scott. Roger Houston. We hear you. Getting smaller every day, but there are certain things you still do. Still say what you think, you still pay for the drinks and beach nuts the tobacco you chew. Weird ideas taking hold, kids won't do what they're told. Who knows what this old world's coming to? But you keep your face to the wind, you don't quit on a friend, and beach nuts the tobacco you chew. Seems like a man's world just isn't the same anymore, but some things you can still trust, like beech nut chewing tobacco. Beech nut just keeps on getting better. Beech nut's a lot moister these days, with more taste, less stems. Today's beech nut, fresher, longer-lasting flavor. You ought to try it. Girls in bars, girls in pants, the man just don't stand a chance, but there's still ways to show them who's who. Treat your dogs with respect, you keep your traps oiled and checked, and beech nut's the tobacco you chew. I'm Rod Serling. Close your eyes, exercise your imagination, and join us again on our next presentation of The Zero Hour. Skylab, Are You There? is an original radio drama written by Keith Walker. William Shatner was heard as Richard Cuddle. Featured in the cast were Jacques Denbo, Kathleen Cordell, Casey Kasem, Les Tremaine, and Jack Crucial. Zero Hour, created by J.M. Polis. Directed by Don Hills, he is produced in Hollywood for the Mutual Broadcasting System by Radio Productions Incorporated. Music is composed and conducted by Stanley B. Hoffman, Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. This has been a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System. That was Skylab, Are You There? from Zero Hour here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was Tim's selection this week, uh, something 
I knew was out there, and I'm really glad to have finally had the opportunity to be forced to listen to this because it's always been on my list to try to give this a listen. Uh, just so everybody knows, you're listening to us tell each other for the first time what we think of these. We keep it a secret from each other so that we catch that that gold in the recording. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is, you know, I don't know anything about what's going on until we read these intros. Right, so I didn't know anything. Tim sends me this thing like zero or what's that? So first thing, Rod Serling comes on like sweet. That's right, Rod Serling. Oh, it got so much better. <laughs> Tim sent me a Rod Serling thing with William Shatner in it, and I was like, oh God, Tim, I love you. So I texted him and I said, Tim, I'm gonna hug you so hard. Thank you so much. This is gonna be so great. And as I was listening, I texted. I said. Oh my God! Is that Casey Kasem? <laughs> <laughs> and it just kept getting better and better and better. And then the commercials were still in it, which was phenomenal. What a huge amount of fun that was! Too bad it was terrible. <laughs> I was like, Oh no! He, I had the same trajectory, only he stayed aloft. No. <laughs> His solar panels didn't disintegrate like mine did. <laughs> it was a really hard listen with all of the radio crackle back and forth and the radio static. And there's, although I appreciate the effort of all of that and the, the realness I of it, honestly, do not appreciate it. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it is literally twenty minutes of. Yeah. <laughs> beep, boop, beep, boop. <laughs> is anyone out there? <laughs> hey ho, Rose, or whatever it is. <laughs> You I, Earth people are too uncivilized to play our space golf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to start in the context of why I chose Zero Hour. Because Shatner was in it? No. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know if you would call that earlier I was trying to find at least one series that starts with each letter of the alphabet. Oh, that's right. Uh, and I hadn't gotten Z yet. Uh, we're still missing one that I can't think of off the top of my head. But yes, I'll, I'll get it. Um, so I knew that Zero Hour was a good option for Z, and some listeners had also pitched this to me, so I knew like this is the one I'm going to listen to. I, I listened to a few of them and discovered that the commercials are still there. I was just like, oh, I love these commercials so much. Yes. Uh, you got to listen to more of these, because the selection is big of the, the fun commercials. Yeah. And then when I listened to this episode, the combination of William Shatner, Casey Kasem, which I, I didn't put him in the intro. I, I'm assuming most people kind of know who Casey Kasem is. But if you don't, uh, radio personality, um, did Billboard Top 40 radio show for a long time, voice of Shaggy and Robin from Super Friends. Mm -hmm. um, no, Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Yes. Thank you. Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> <laughs> this one goes out to a little girl with leukemia in Wichita. Sorry, keep going. Uh, and this story, it fascinates me. It starts with, like, an attempt towards super hard science being a very specific real space station talking about the the solar panels broken damaged the uh, fuel pod and like things that the uh, attitude of the the space station is off and all these things that are really crunchy and like yes this is believable and then it slowly slid into like these terms sound like gibberish of gamma sensors <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and then when it got to monotone, Martian guy, like, ah! Right. They, they monotone? He sounded like he was trying to stifle a belch the entire <laughs> time he talked. Like, I'm hot. <laughs> I can see many alternate futures, <laughs> including like, one in which zero hour doesn't suck. <laughs> uh, and because I've been watching What If lately, like, oh, that's a, it's like the constipated Uatu of... <laughs> <laughs> the what now? <laughs> Do you know the What If series of comics? Yes, I've been watching them. Uh, watch was the Watcher's name. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, the big guy in the sky with the giant head that That's knows the everything? Guy, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that, dude. Uh, yeah, the What Ifs are great. Let's talk about that, because <laughs> that would make me much happy. No, so you were with me. The thrill of hearing Serling, who I love. Oh, yeah. Not only him, but he's a great writer. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Rod Serling. He didn't write this, by the way. No, I'm just yeah. saying, in general, I love Rod, everything about Rod Serling. Yeah. Including his story and how he got to where he was. And he's just a really interesting dude. But how do and you make Shatner, a story with Captain Kirk and the voice of Robin the Boy Wonder boring? Right. That's what I'm getting at. Is like, oh, here we go. And when I heard Casey Casey, the first thing was, okay, so you're going to stop doing these radio transmissions pretty soon, right? And they just wouldn't stop doing the radio transmission bit. And it would not go away. 
And it was, oh my God, it's so hard to listen to. And again, the payoff on this thing was ludicrous. <laughs> I mean, this would have been a tired story 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, this wouldn't have made the cut on Dimension X. Right. I, I want to point out something to our listeners who didn't know about Skylab that you mentioned in the beginning of this. The other thing that people who might be younger than us don't remember or know, they weren't alive, they wouldn't remember, uh, is that as Skylab was re-entering the atmosphere and there was a huge watch on it because we were terrified for about three months on where it was going to land. And there were not only Vegas had lines on that that you could win money, <laughs> <laughs> but they were guessing at the damage if it landed in certain parts would be monumental. And so people were terrified and people were like not going outside or putting steel structures above their houses. It was crazy. It was a deal. Yeah. It was a huge deal. And people got really scared as this over the months amplified like, okay, where's Skylab going to come down? And eventually crashed in the ocean and we were all fine. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's just a really interesting thing that people have forgotten about the Skylab crashing. Yeah, yeah. Well, as my one of my creative writing professors mm -hmm. said, uh, the truth is no defense for bad fiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> as interesting as the real Skylab is, right? It doesn't do much to resuscitate this this story. Uh, you... But the one thing I thought was interesting is that it felt like to me William Shatner was phoning it in, especially since he's often accused of overacting. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Casey was working his socks off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a big discrepancy in energy. Oh, absolutely. And it wasn't just a character choice. And it was unfortunate because Casey's energy makes him sound a little bit too much like uh, Shaggy yeah. or Casey Kasem or a Scoob. DJ. Yeah, <laughs> or, or a DJ. You know, like he, need, he needed to pull it back and Shatner needed to bring some more of his Shatner energy to it. That was ironic. You didn't listen to the other four of Shatner that week. No, I didn't I didn't know until after I listened to this, I was writing the intro, that it was structured like that, the second series, that it would be one actor for all, all so five episodes are, a week. Are the other four available of Shatner for that week? I don't know. No, I want to find out. I wasn't actually that bothered by the, the radio static. I, I thought it added a nice texture, and I was just torn about the amazing speed with which everything got done. Oh, there's he's having uh, health problems. All right, we'll have men up to you in space in 24 hours. Yeah. It's not believable, but I don't mind. Like, yeah, you go fast. That's fine. The writing also was clunky in the sense of letting us know the time had passed and we were somewhere else now. It, it, a, a sentence would be uttered, and then the next sentence, you'd have to discern, oh, we're later or somewhere else now. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It wasn't uh, a music transition, for example, to let us know the time had passed. But it's all so unfortunate. Yeah, I think I liked it better than both of you, but still, the ending was so bizarre and out of left field, and well, I'm with the clichéest of clichés. I'm with you on the the radio transmission communication narrative style. I think it's a really good idea because, as you said, it started very real. Like this is very realistic until it they started <laughs> making up words. But I like the idea of it being almost narratively documentary, mm -hmm. almost, you know, like we just pieced together some actual transmissions to tell you this story. Yeah. I think that's a pretty cool concept and idea. I think it was grating on the ears. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where you need to adjust reality mm -hmm. to make it work as a piece of artificiality. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I just felt it was difficult to follow and became impatient uh, with it, I guess, um, mm -hmm. is what I struggled with. And at one point, uh, one of the guys in uh, ground control actually says, the suspense is killing me. And I'm like, <laughs> no, it really is. And it's something else. You better see a doctor because it's not the suspense. <laughs> right. I, I think it's also, you know, you can't go wrong with, hey, we lost contact with these people. Let's send someone in. And finding out they're not there, especially in outer space. That yeah, basis that was of a story, that's a great moment. That's a great story. Like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, now we have a space mystery for starters. Space mystery! <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a little ooky and spooky. But then it just fell apart. They didn't have a good answer for, what's the solution? Right. The alien with gas. Hob. <laughs> yeah, oh, and that's the other thing. <laughs> Are you sure that's your name? Don't give it a name. It doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> Need a name. 
the story also seems to be sort of assert the theme of this is a truth that's been hidden from you that, that uh, certain forces keep this truth from the the public that it has no impact like that that doesn't mean anything the fact that you were told to keep this secret yeah that didn't really land the way i think it was meant to well it's that star trek discovery right all right a bunch <laughs> of stuff happened in the past None of you can talk about it. <laughs> That's how we'll explain the canon. Giant conspiracy. You know, you know the rule on conspiracy, like that once it gets above three people, the odds of it <laughs> go down so exponentially by a three million percent yeah. once it gets to three people knowing that it can stay. So when you hear conspiracy theories that involve literally hundreds and hundreds of people, if not more, nope. The odds are astronomical. Especially yep. with Casey Kasem, because he, <laughs> he gets on his radio show and he's like, this one goes out to Hob. <laughs> keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars, Hob. <laughs> the, the other unfortunate downside of the end was trying to compare to the glory that is that Beachwood tobacco ad. Oh, yeah. Wow. He struggled to make sense of it. I knew, it's a macho ad, but some of it... It's was just, uh, strange. I listened to it too many times to try to get all the lyrics. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> you got um, some of them? Uh, a man's world isn't the same anymore with girls in pants. Men just don't stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have your love of 70s radio commercials. This might as well have just been, you know, uh, Zero Hour brought to you by depressing 70s products. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I... I'm going to spoil it for you guys. One of the other ones I listened to, there was an ad from, I think, the St. Jude, uh, Franciscans, some, some sort oh, of yeah. public service thing that was talking about love and asking I'm some out. child, like, does chicken taste like love? It's like, no, no, chicken doesn't taste like love. What about <laughs> steak? Does steak taste like love? Like, no. What? People. People <laughs> taste like love. Brought to you by Ed Gein. <laughs> What? Love, it's made out of people. <laughs> mm, this really does taste like love. Oh. Soylent love. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know how bad this is? How much time we spent in this podcast talking about anything but this? <laughs> <laughs> so we're being hard on Tim's pick. Huh? Oh, no, no. I no I, I'm really excited about this, not because I think it's great, but because it's such a weird mix, a weird moment in time yeah, of like got... 70 sci-fi and not quite good enough to be 50 sci-fi, which I don't mean to slam on 50 sci-fi, but it's like it, it doesn't have a ending that matches the tone of the beginning. No. And the fact that it mentions Skylab by name and it's just a weird little nugget of history. I want to be really clear. I'm really happy you brought this to the podcast for all of those reasons. All the people that are in it, the era that it was, the, so that we can contrast it to the style of sci-fi of that time, to you know, Dimension X or X-1, kind of a beginning of sci-fi. There's so many reasons to love having this in our podcast and to have listened to it. <laughs> Just because I was like, ah, oh, that wasn't great at the end doesn't mean it wasn't great. <laughs> to have in the podcast like it's it's a phenomenal thing to discuss and not the least of which is what we discussed like how did you screw this up you had <laughs> and in all fairness i think i had a more negative reaction to it because of rod serling william shatner and casey case i'm just like yeah i had this idea of what that team yeah. up would be you can't miss yeah oh yeah, you can sure exactly what <laughs> uh, but it's what i'm saying but now i just can't help but continue to imagine different Shatner, Casey Kasem, mashups. <laughs> <laughs> TJ Hooker pulling over the mystery machine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shatner was during the same time period uh, providing a voiceover for the uh, animated Star Trek series. This oh, is yeah. cool. Which is a great, which is much series. better than this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, by the way, to speak about something completely different now that you brought that up, uh, have you seen the um, uh, Flash Gordon cartoon series at the same time? We'll talk about that when you get off the air. It's as good as the Star Trek animated series. Oh, the Flash Gordon from back then? Yeah. Oh, I remember seeing that when I was growing up. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I yeah. loved it as a kid. It's really good. Anyway, back to uh, Oh, uh, Do we have to? <laughs> Skylab, are you there? Have you guys read the novelization by Judy Bloom? 
Scott oh. are you there? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Hello, Margaret. <laughs> it is me, Hob. It's okay, you are growing up. I do exist, but you cannot tell anyone. <laughs> I I would like to vote. <laughs> uh, unless someone else has no, uh, no. gems of information. Uh, it definitely it was so worth the listen for so many reasons. One, it's it literally was like watching Battle of the Network Stars. It it had a bunch of seventies references, the commercials, and I thought it had a premise that was pretty good. Also tying into the Skylab thing that was going on at that moment. And um I think it's historically significant to listen to for a lot of reasons. It, but no, it fails in a lot of other ways. So it's not uh it's not great. Yeah, I, I, I'm on that same same page of, this is not a classic. It has not aged well, but it is historically fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and I really do want to listen to more Zero Hour. Yeah. I think the beach nut ad is stands the test of time. <laughs> <laughs> now we have women in bars. Can you imagine? <laughs> ah, Not the bars I go to. Before I vote, I do want to mention the one thing I forgot to say that I like about this. And that is the jazzy theme music yeah Yeah. i really thought that works it's not what i expected and the incongruity i thought was really cool so thumbs up for that um but otherwise yeah it's of historical interest in that it is a thing that happened in the (laughs) past which is now part of history (laughs) well there is much of history that i don't mind ignoring (laughs) true all right Tim, tell them stuff. Hey, please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. Uh, you'll find other episodes there. Episodes from series starting with 25 out of 26 different letters. And we <laughs> hope to have a 26 letter here soon. I don't know. You? Maybe it's you? I don't know. It's always you. <laughs> it's not me. Uh, you can vote in polls, leave messages, request episodes, send us messages, um, link to our social media pages. There's all kinds of ways. Talk to us with your communicube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you can link to the Threadless and Patreon. Yes, you can also go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. Now, last week I asked for some testimonials from patrons to record and send to us that we would play on the podcast. Uh, but since we're recording these back to back, I have yet to receive one. <laughs> <laughs> so for you listeners, that was literally 30 minutes ago in our time. So either we've gotten some and we'll play them now. <laughs> or, or please we might... send us some. <laughs> this is really confusing, but it makes a more interesting science fiction story. <laughs> <laughs> Skylab, are you there? If you would like to see us performing live... Don't. <laughs> we do live performances. The Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society Theater Company does recreations of classic old-time radio dramas live on stage and a lot of our own original work. Uh, if you'd like to see us performing live, uh, uh, please go to ghoulishdelights.com or mysteriousoldradiolistingsociety.com. There you'll see every month for about five years now we're somewhere... We're, performing uh you'll see what we're doing uh, and you can buy tickets and come see us if you're not in the area that we're performing in then you can buy an online ticket and you can watch it the live stream which is a high quality live stream or you can watch pay and buy a ticket and watch the recording of it later so we'd love to have you in one way shape or form see our live shows at mysterious old radio listening society.com or ghoulish delights.com what is coming up next next we have a listener request we will be listening to too many smiths from suspense until then Look out! the suspense is killing me yeah